you're making music more for yourself or for others? Oh, that's a fantastic question. Um, I, I, I think that I've always made music for myself because, um, the audience usually, you know, my biggest joy in, in music usually is the escape of it sitting in whatever zone I'm in. Or when I was a kid, it was a bunch of guitar pedals and effects and just kind of dreamy, just kind of lost myself in music. And my dad was a musician. So he always said like, uh, you know, music will never fail you. It's always going to be your go-to. And he was right. So I, I think it's from myself um that mainly for myself but there's obviously a, like an an interest in people enjoying it but but again it's like what music what certain bands have done for me i just want to do that for someone else because again they escape element to it yeah yeah there's something about the um i i kind of never know where i'm i don't know if i see it as kind of a as an escape more just as like a um I don't know how to put it. It sounds, I sound really sort of casual about it if I just say like a, a pursuit because it's something I'm trying to make a career of. But I've, I don't know. I've never necessarily felt that kind of need to... It, it, do, you, do you feel is escapism like the right word for you? Is it that kind of profound or is it something more... Um, maybe 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 because there, there is a destination and the destination is the process of music. Fascination with no choices. Um, yeah, I absolutely be being better at my craft being um opening up a new um a new area in my playing a, a different strategy on the fretboard a different melody a different way to sing a melody or you know that pursuit i guess is a good word but it is i i i love immersing myself in the process of music so that's why I use the word escape because it, it is absolutely a blockage from everything else that's going on in my life. It's the most comfortable place that I'm at when it, when I'm creating music. It's absolutely the fish. I'm the fish in the water and that I'm usually more awkward outside of music, you know, and socially it's not my best. I don't, I'm not my, the best version of myself in music. I, I'm very comfortable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I totally get what you're saying. It's a, it's kind of um. I was talking. So the the guy who uh, asked your question was Jordan from Dream Theater. We we're talking about that like immersion in the, um, and that kind of form of communication that you get from music, where, um, you know, I, I see what you mean. Like some people in kind of, it is their social thing. It's how they kind of communicate certain ideas. Um, I was looking, I was looking at your kind of, um, going through your sort of Instagram feed and stuff and seeing how, um, watching your sort of creative process. I quite liked how you were sort of putting, I really like what you were talking about of taking the first idea you have that day and just getting that down. You know, I, I, I think there's so much to be said for I, that, that was just starting the process. You know, um, I found I can sit there for an hour and like warm up or you know jam or whatever whereas if i just pressed record i think something might happen but i just you know you're always a bit nervous to commit to that um yeah what, what kind of prompted you into that sort of mindset well um <clears throat> for me it was just about generating ideas and the if you when you've done it as long as i have or anyone that's done it for a long time you hit these dry spells you hit these brick walls creatively so um there was this expectation that was put on myself there's this history and archive of music that i've already done um where i begin plagiarizing myself and i start doing the same things the same moves and um ultimately i would always sit down like okay what kind of song am i going to write and i put these parameters around <laughs> my, myself and i'm like uh, and then I'm just like, you know what? I, every day I, I can kind of, I come down and give myself an hour every day to just create document something. And the, the best ideas I have usually are the first within the first hour. And, um, after that, I just kind of, I start grinding out. I mean, there are times where I get completely like, you know, involved in the process for hours, but for the most part, that first hour is crucial and I'm balancing my family life and everything else. So I hope, but I do give myself an hour or more every day to just create and whatever that first thing is. Sometimes I'm like, I want to write a, you know, I want to have some Southern rock kind of standard tuning 
you know, big over compressed drum, just very simplistic song. And I'm, and I'll start that process and, and, and it just kind of, it, it, there is no ceiling to it, which is, I find when I don't have any expectation, don't sit down. It's usually the first thing I riff out on, or I usually build a beat first to kind of jam because that goes back to the garage band where I would always be in a garage with my band, local guys trying to figure out how to be in a band together. And it was always like, get, play a beat and I'll try to write something on top of it. I've always been a percussive player. And so th it's always that. So I'll, I'll build a drum beat first and just kind of loop it and just jam on it and riff and then start building a song from there. Yeah. 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 Do, do you ever find that you, like that, like that idea of just getting the first thing down and and kind of mimicking that, you know, that what it would be like if you're in a in a group like that. Do you, is that? I know for me, you know, I was talking about avoiding that sort of procrastination. Have you ever been guilty of like sort of that getting stuck in that mindset? You talked about obviously getting that where you start rewriting your own things, you know, that kind of plagiarizing yourself. Um, do you ever get stuck in those kind of things where you're almost overthinking? the process if that makes sense a, a thousand percent and that's that's another reason i started incorporating this do something every day um thing but my procrastination comes with the completion of a song i'm scared to start the vocal although writing vocals for a, a musical piece is my is the ultimate part for me like i love guitar obviously and the, that when I do the vocals, that's when it is okay. I, I have this fear of this. I have this really um, like what I think is a really great piece of music and a, a basic arrangement. And I'm like, I don't want to screw it up with the vocals. Cause then it, it, there's this thing that happens that I have this vision and I start getting it. And then the more I ch chip away and arrange the song and complete it, it's, it gets diluted and I start taking safe turns and I'm like, Oh, that's not it. That's not that core idea that I was excited about. A completed idea isn't that because I in some way lost my path and, and started trying to do the, the comfortable things where there's this one really raw piece that's amazing, I think. And then I'm like, I just start copping out uh, as the process goes. Um, but I, I think the procrastination is definitely I'm scared to do the vocals because when I do that, that'll be the complete song. And then it might not be good enough when I really want to hold on to this and this hope that now I've, I've turned this new corner creatively. This idea is what I've been looking for, you know, for five years, I've been looking for this kind of riff. I don't want to ruin it by finishing mm. it. <laughs> is that kind of in this, you know what I mean? It's weird. Yeah. I mean, there's that like the, the, you know, it's, it sounds like I'm kind of going quite deep with it, but that sort of fear, like that fear of failure that you get when you, you, you know, as you get closer to the end of that song or, you know, I'm sometimes nervous to start a song because in my own head, I'm already like, is it going to be as good as anything I've written before? And I suppose the answer really should be, does it even have to be? Or like what, call, what, what defines good? You know, like, um, I think it's so easy to fall into that, you know, uh, f like I, I think fear of failure is kind of how I, so it's the thing I need to get out of. I know if I get into a certain headspace, so I was really proud of like, I, I've not with this band anymore that I sort of started out with. And I was really proud of the first piece of music we put out. Um, and, and it was, it's really great. We, we worked with a brilliant producer. who's a big fan of yours actually. Um, and, uh, uh, and now I kind of listen to that and obviously I'm listening to this really brilliantly produced, you know, um, piece of music like sound quality and songwriting, I like to think. And then you play this like shitty demo with some like, you know, un unprocessed drums and you're like, what is this? This isn't anything, you know, yeah. um, do you, do you kind of, do you have a, a, in some sense a, a bit of that f like fear of, I'm not trying to spin this all negatively, but, um, no. that kind of worry of like, Oh, is this going to be as good as the last thing? Does that, or, or are you good at just sort of drowning that out? Well, one thing that I've done to remedy that fear, which I think almost any artist that has done it for any amount of time. And it does, doesn't, doesn't mean like commercially successful artists, just that anyone that does this, uh, passionately, um, there's that fear of, Oh man, I'm, I'm losing a step. I, and I think that's a healthy fear for me because it's always been, I, I want, I don't want to do a release where people start saying, or I say to myself, it's not as good 
that it's a dud. It's not what it was. There's not the spark. So it's like that fear keeps me grinding at and working more. And one thing that I, I was going to mention about remedy, the remedy for that fear is, is that by doing, I know that every idea that I have is a part of the process to get to the song that really, really means something and has depth that has composition that I'm proud of. And so I think all the song ideas that I do, 75% of them are average. Uh, I don't put, I know by now the amount of times I've done this process, I need to, sh I need to, I need to filter and flush these ideas out. So I get to the one that is like, Oh, that, that has, that's something that's special. That has something about it that is, is, uh, um, worth pursuing. So all the ideas that I'll put, you know, out throughout a week or a month or a year, you know, 20 of those end up being one good idea. And that's just part of the process. I enjoy going through the average songs because, you know, I don't think I do anything that I just, well, there are, there are songs that I've done that I'm like, that's just rubbish. I'm going to delete it. I don't want to even think about someone hearing it and trying to, to work this into my, <laughs> into my, uh, you know, as an option. So, but yeah, do, it's all part of the process. Yeah. Do you, if you, if you've got an idea that you're not like, massively keen on do you tend to follow it through and like finish the idea like how long do you take that idea before you kind of go now nah, that like that one's not a keeper like what because i never know where i don't want to quit you know i'm like have i i, I always think what there was there yeah. must have been something you know i must have written you know you, if you stick with an idea for more than like 20 minutes half an hour you like there's something there and i never know at what point do i go nah that's not it or yeah. cause you're like, can I you're like, surely there must be a way I can spin this. Do you, do you have like a, a point where you're like, okay, I need to just do something different now. Well, I mean, let me ask you this and I'll add, do a question for your question. Go on. Do you take a step back and then do the circle back where you listen to the idea a week, a week later to give it that fresh ear perspective? Because there's been times where I've spent a long time on an idea that I thought was good and just started taking a weird direction or, or it reminds me of another song I hate. Like there's been songs where like, Oh, this is genius. And then it's an exact melody of a song. And I'm like, and it'll, it'll hit you. Like, that's why I liked it. But then, then there are songs that I spent so much time on and I, I lose my perspective, leave it, put it away, put it in my little Dropbox folder go back a week later and then I'll, I'm like with fresh ears driving around I'm like, Oh, that is cool. And if, if it's not cool enough, I'm like, I'm going to take that and do an adjustment here, maybe a different chord change here, maybe speed it up. But it's like, I'll listen to it with fresh ears. And then if, if I still don't like it, I know it's like, you know, let's delete it, just get rid of it. But yeah, sometimes I, stepping away from it. I, I do. I, I totally get that, but I find sometimes I, I think what happens is there's, it's a, for me, like when I'm writing something, it's a bit of a moment in time, you know, and if I don't, if I don't fin, it is not like I have to finish the whole song, but if I don't complete like, you know, the 10, 20 second bit that I'm doing, if I, I feel like if I, I know what in my head, what this thing is meant to go towards. It might, I don't know maybe what it's meant to sound like in three hours time, but I know kind of the direction it's going. But that feels quite temporary. And I find if I ditch that, I either have to sit there and like push it for a few, normally it is a few hours. Um, I remember there was this one part I wrote, it's like a clean finger style part. Um, and, and I was, I spent, I slaved over it for like a couple of weeks. And it was like the only thing I was writing for like a couple of weeks. <laughs> and then, and then I got to the end and then I just strummed through the chords. I was like, fuck, that's so much better. <laughs> like just oh, literally just strummed through the chords and they sounded so great. Just like strum it. I was like, oh, wow. Okay. Um, but it, you know, it was worth it because I really liked the chord. And then it turned out like, and then funnily enough, I ended up, so I wrote a whole song around this chord progression and then that clean finger picked part now doesn't work with the song very well. It works way better just to strum the chords. So I'm like, and it was with my old band and I remember the bass player was like, no, we'll keep it in. And I was like, no, there's no one keeping it just because, <laughs> just because I spent ages on it, you know? Um, but interestingly, yeah. the thing I was going to say, actually, I, I found, um, I don't know how much you would maybe resonate with this, but I've been, 
like I'm kind of stuck in a bit of I, I'm f- figuring out what direction I want to pursue. I'm kind of a f- free agent as a musician at the moment. I'm trying to figure out which way to go. And um, I found myself way more drawn to starting with the lyrics now, which is never something I would ever do. But every time I pick up a guitar, I, I like quite techy riffs, you know, and 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 um, and sort of finger style, the, the more technical stuff on that end. I find my brain just doesn't engage with it if it's not got a bit of challenge there. I can always pull it back, but when it's when I'm writing, it's got to be. And when you do that, sometimes it all just sounds like a bit a bit samey to me, you know, and maybe I just need more inspiration. But I find if I start with a lyric, I'm like, oh, I know what the feeling behind this is going to be. Um, and it's not like I go, oh, well, that's got to be a minor seventh chord because that's that, you know, I just, I, I know the mood, the, the sort of the mood. And I feel like that I, I, I started to work towards beginning there, which is never something I thought I would do. I'd always start with a riff, you know. Um, is that something you've you've done at all? Or do you tend to, you've, the way you've described it, it sounds like you start more with the the music and then add the vocals once you've got an idea of that. You know, I get the question a lot. What do you start with? And um, I think it's interesting what you said when you said <clears throat> the lyrics can almost nudge where where the musical direction goes, the topic, the vibe. I've never thought about it like that because I'm like really interested in scoring music for film. And there's like uh, there's an element of looking at the, the, the scene and then trying to speak musically a language that that kind of supports the scene and, and as you know, emotionally impacts the scene. And so you try to make those kind of marry the music with the, with the tempo of the actual scene that you're watching the lyrics, I guess, could be viewed out the same way. I would have to, I would have to, I mean, if I were writing, there's like times where I've thought about a topic, a story that I want to write about or, something in my childhood that was this and that, or just some kind of an emotional backstory that I want to focus on. And that, that can sway the the vibe of what musical piece I'm going to write. But um, it's always like, if I even go anywhere near vocals before the music, it's usually a melody line. Um, even before the lyrics, the melody is kind of, um, when I do any vocals, it's always a melody line first, and then I put insert the the lyrics after. But it's interesting. I've never thought about trying. When you say lyrics, were you talking about a vocal melody and lyrics, or just like in more of a like a poetry kind of, you know what I mean? Some really just mm-hmm. few lines that move you, and then you start writing around that. Yeah. So like I wouldn't. It's not like they would have necessarily like a cadence or a flow. It's just like the the words but literally just the yeah. words you know so that way i could um a real pet peeve of mine is hearing um uh lyrics that where the emphasis falls in a weird place in the word um yeah oh yeah you yeah, know yeah. where <laughs> uh, yeah you know exactly what i mean and you're like you know talk no one talks like that and it's just i get sometimes it can work like sometimes you know um it worked for like umbrella in for rihanna but like that's a that's you know, a good example that works yeah. that's I, I think love that, those, yeah. Yeah. Doesn't she say like cano instead of no, or if I just misheard the lyrics? Well, there's like an ultimate example of that is that um Elton John song, um Marilyn Monroe. Like he he, he, he dances the syllable of her yeah. name. Uh what's the song? <laughs> I don't know. Candle sure, in the wind. Oh, oh, um it is called Candle in the Wind. The wind. Yeah, you know, the yeah. Marilyn Monroe. I'm sorry. Oh, I just, okay. <laughs> I don't, yeah, because I think someone told me that that's like the most popular song ever or something. And I was like, I don't know this. I, I remember when yeah. that, I was like, oh, I don't know. It was only, it was that moment. I was like, oh, I guess I should probably know this song. It's um, a huge song, yeah. Yeah. You get, I mean, I think you can get away with it with vowels, you know, like an R sound. You can jump around the vocal melody. But when, like, when you, you know, when when you emphasize a weird part of the word, it just really grinds on me every time. There's yeah. one band I'm not going to say, but they, it, I really like the band. But it's just I hear it, it's in like a lot of their songs. I'm like, there's no one like being like guys. 
you know. Um, so if you were if you were producing the band, you'd be like, all right, day one. Oh, it would be day one. Yeah, <laughs> we're ending. We're never going to pronounce this, and this we're never going to jump this the syllable. I'd be like, you know, the teacher with the the the, the wooden stick against the blackboard, just whacking yeah. like the like this and then this, <laughs> like. Yeah, it oh, just man. it just gets you know that you know they would have they would do it like for probably the first couple of days they was like check this out You're like no yeah. that's it we're not doing that yeah thing is they're a huge band so I would get fired yeah. like immediately um, yeah that's uh, yeah it's I don't know oh that's what I was going to ask you um, you talking about film scores um, do you have like any favorite uh, composers or particular film scores that come to mind um, I mean there's the, the obvious you know, the top people, Hans Zimmer, you know, mm. I did that master class and oh yeah. Uh, yeah. he's just like the guy and Trent Reznor, obviously him and Atticus are doing very cool things. Um, there are, I mean, the basic ones, you know, the John Williams and the, the ones that are the godfathers of the craft, but I'm just now getting into like trying to find people at all different levels. And I'm a couple of musicians that I know that have transferred transitioned into, into that life, uh, that career. And, um, I'm, it, it's just an interest that I, I'm, I'm going to pursue it as, as much as I can, but I know it's a very, I, I have much respect for people that do that. And it is a different animal than writing music and writing songs and, um, but I, I do, I just love building, uh, soundscapes and ambient, you know, just very, I'm just very, uh, interested in that. And I'm, and when I look back at when, as a, when I was a kid, I used to love, like, I would get, I would get like Casio, the first little Casio keyboards. And I would, I would hit these things and try to make like these scary theme songs. And I would, you know, I, when I'm, I just kind of abandoned that when I got into the band stuff, but I was really obsessed with that when I was a kid and listening to, uh, I paid attention to the music that would, would be in, obviously there's Halloween and all those songs, but there's that really are just everything to the scene. But, um, I used to do that when I was a kid. So I guess I'm just kind of circling back to that, that, uh, interest and passion and, uh, I have a lot of tools at my disposal now, and it's a lot more fun. I, I have way more than a, key, a Casio keyboard to play with, and um, but yeah, it, it's a. I have much respect, and I have a few people that are trying to mentor me into it. So I look forward to learning about it. Yeah, the the bit I always, um, I'm sure I've mentioned it to someone else on the podcast is a, one of the best moments of film squeeze. Like speaking to Hans Zimmer, um, I really. There's, have you seen Interstellar? Yes. So like spoiler. He uses that as an example a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Like spoiler for anyone that hasn't seen it. But um, at the end when he's, you know, that scene where he sees his daughter when she's like, quite, I don't know how old she is, obviously well older than yeah. him. Um, and the way the music moves with, I can't remember where I heard this, who it was that pointed this out. Um, but how the music moves with the, the questions it, it, like in the conversation. If you watch that scene back and you look at how the melody, like he asks a question and the melody it kind of rises and then she gives an answer and it sort of drops and it's like a really, it's, 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 there's way more to it when you, you know, when you're aware of it. Um, yeah, but the other one, on it. the other one, I'll have to send you the YouTube videos. Have you seen Charles Cornell on YouTube? He's like a jazz pianist guy, he analyzes like film scores and stuff. Have you seen, no, seen the guy? No, I need to, I, I'm already into it there. What, he, what so he, he picked up on, and I think it must be a purposeful thing, but in the Rogue One, the Star Wars, um, you know, yes. the scene where Darth Vader comes in at the end, again, spoiler, oh, sorry. It's amazing. So yeah, it's amazing. listen to the tone of his lightsaber because there's the chords in the background and they're just like minor chords or something, but his lightsaber is like pitched they must have played the chords to fit it and the lightsaber yeah. pitch changes what the chord is um and then the chord changes and so does the pitch of the lightsaber and you're like they can't that can't have been a mistake i'm, I'm gonna watch it i'll send it, it it's right it, after this it, it, it's it's such a the way and obviously he's like the way he talk he gets so excited talking about it and it's like it's too good to be a coincidence i think if it yeah. is it's amazing um it's like yeah, yeah. you definitely got to um like check that out it's um you know it's amazing I, that scene that whole scene is so that's the best version of darth vader in any of those in any of that entire history of star wars that yeah. that version of him is the best the most menacing there is something about that 
because you obviously you don't know it's coming like you know it's that i think there's that bit like are we gonna get that moment yeah and then it then you do i mean i'm not even a big he's, star he's ruthless like, you know yeah. it's like he's it's it's way more aggressive and mm. yeah no no voice it's just annihilation you know? well it's done it's a bit like with how james bond used to be this like suave kind of you know he would sort of dance yeah. around and get everyone whereas modern james bond like he gets the shit beaten out of him but he sort of comes out the other end it's they definitely have up yeah. to this sort of grit in these in the like in movies nowadays um but like there's there's something something else that's kind of um interesting. I saw um again sort of looking through your um Instagram and stuff, you seem quite interested in like your sort of fitness and, and sort of health and fitness. I saw you did that like seventy five hard challenge. Um yeah. like i so I've I've been sort of looking at that. I don't know if I can I, I like to think I keep myself in decent shape. I don't know if I can bring myself to do to do that. Um <laughs> personally. But um is it does that come from like is that something you've always been, have you always been like active and um, sort of pursued that sort of lifestyle or is that something that has come to you as like a, a sort of a, a remedy? Like a lot of people see it as a, you know, um, uh, particularly I think a lot of people in creative places see it as something to keep, you know, healthy body, healthy mind and that. Um, what kind of brought yeah. you to that kind of lifestyle? Um, I think the it it's changed over the years the motivation to do it um when i was younger in a band and one of the first bands i was in the whole band was kind of health conscious and we wanted to look good and feel good on stage you know i was drinking a lot then but we were still pretty pretty fit and active you know as younger men you could do you can get away with that stuff but um <clears throat> when i i kind of got away from it for a while when my alcoholism really kicked in i just kind of fell deep into that even through all of that, I was always trying to run and sweat it out and do all these things. But um, when I got sober is when the fitness really was uninterrupted. It was something I always loved doing. But when I got sober, there was nothing to get in the way of it. So it was completely uh, immersed myself into fitness. And it's always been a huge thing for my mental health. It's always been something that has helped me with my sobriety. Uh, it makes me feel good. I'm very much addicted to that in a way, but, um, <clears throat> you know, it's just something that I, I have to do. I do it on a daily basis. I've, I'm fascinated with nutrition. I'm fascinated with, um, you know, longevity, um, pushing my body to places I didn't think I could do. And, but there's not, it's not from a vanity place. It's more, I mean, obviously you want to look good. Everyone wants to look good and, but I just feel that something about the way the release, the stress, the depression that keeps at bay, all the things that come to come with that kind of exertion. Uh, it's just, you know, there's a ton of science behind it now. And there's a ton of, um, you know, proof that it just it puts you in a better position, you know, mentally, physically, spiritually, it can open up a lot more of uh, um, just clarity in your life for me. So yeah, I, 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 I'm very, very much into it. Um, you know, I'm 51 years old, you know, I, I, I still feel pretty good. There's definitely things that happen, you know, as in terms of aging that slow you down a little bit, but I'm able to do a lot more than most 51 year olds can do. And, um, I think it's, I, I, I give a lot of credit to, to you know, my, my passion for music and all the things I still love to do. I, you know, fitness has been a huge thing in terms of me still appreciating it, you know, and it, you know, again, it helps keep me sober and that's the biggest thing. Yeah. I, I've, um, I can totally sort of relate to that. I think the last, um, sort of six months or so, um, kind of tied in with new year's resolutions, but it, it, though it wasn't really, I sort of decided, okay, I need to, I never went fully out of shape, like massively last year, but I, de I was definitely, I wasn't massively like overweight, but I certainly wasn't fit, you know? Um, mm -hmm. and I, I, I remember after I said this to someone else, but like after about three weeks of exercising and at that point, you're not much fitter than you were three weeks before. Right. But I felt so much better. I, I felt a noticeable change. Um, from those three, even just those three weeks. And, and something that I said, I remember saying was like, I wonder how many people are just like three weeks of something, whether it's exercise or regular, I don't know, meditation or, or writing a song every day or something like three weeks away from, you know, breaking through some sort of barrier in, in that sense. Um, cause I, I feel so much better for like 
exercising, just eating healthy. I was sort of eating healthier as well. So it's like a I sort of doubled up on the um, health and fitness. And it just felt like it set a new baseline. It's like, I don't want to drop below this now. Like now that I'm yeah. there, um, that's it. Yeah. like I feel like it just, it, your, your baseline goes up and you're like, I don't really want to drop below that now. So it, I feel almost an obligation now, you know, even if, especially if I've had a few drinks one night, I'll try and make myself go for a run the next day. Cause I'm like, I'm, I don't want to, yeah. you know, give myself well, the I mean, excuse of, you know, I mean, the the main thing, and I, I try to tell a lot of people this, I don't like to preach it because no one wants to be, you know, hear anyone from a soapbox. But one thing I do always try to tell people, like, if you give it time where at the beginning, it's it's miserable. When you're doing it, it's very humbling. You have any per, people that haven't run for years or done anything or any kind of exercise and for years, the first few weeks are pretty miserable because everything is hard. You know, if you get into it long enough to where – you can feed, feel those endorphins and, it, and that overrides the misery or like if you get through a very hard workout and that the way that you feel afterwards, um, clinging onto that, chasing that feeling, that's what I do. I, the way that I feel after a hard workout or, or even an easy one, if I go for, I go for long walks, uh, you know, I'm a avid walker and, and I think that there's a lot of benefits to that too, especially if you're not really into you know, high intensity stuff. Walking is just a fantastic natural thing that we're all supposed to do that we were put on earth to do. And, um, just that alone uh, helps flush your body out in ways that, uh, you don't get obviously sitting around. But if people get through that first three weeks, like you're talking about, then you start just getting, it starts feeling natural. You get, you feel the highs. It's not as miserable. You're getting stronger. You get, your lung capacity is increasing. You know, it's like not just, it's not just like I'm about to puke and this is miserable. That's what I also tell people to start slow, do 10 minutes, do five minutes, do, do 50 push ups a day, do, you know, again, walk, you know, anything to, to, so you don't turn yourself off because that's what a lot of people do. They do this first miserable day of way too much and they're like, I don't want to do it again because they think that every workout has to look like that and it doesn't, you know. Yeah, I definitely know that that first like, especially the first week, like that feeling of it's not just like you're tired. It's like you've been beaten up and it's just sure, yeah. like, yeah. And I just, yeah, I know, I know I hate that feeling and I don't want to get, but I never want to have that again where yeah. you, 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 your body is so like confused, you know, like what, what yeah. is that? Cause I, I don't mind feeling tired because like I'm fit and healthy and I've worked out hard, but feeling tired just because I'm not ready for this is I just absolutely hate it. Do, yeah. do you follow anyone like, um, have you seen like Andrew Huberman or like Peter Atiyah or any of these people on, on like YouTube or any of them? Um, they sound, those names sound really familiar. Oh man, I got to check this to things to send you, <laughs> to send you now. You, you'll love yeah, them if please. you're, they're super interesting. They talk about, you talked about like longevity and stuff. Um, yeah. they talk a lot about, um, it might be stuff that you already know or that you already do, but, um, they talk a lot about that stuff. It's, I found it super interesting. Yeah. They, they talk particularly the idea of keeping fit at a young age, how it kind of, you know, if you, it will compound later, you know? Um, that's yeah, well, there's a, there's a, there's a great book. It's called younger next year. And it's for people that are generally in the late thirties, forties, fifties. I mean, actually it's for anybody, but, it, but it, it's that concept. If you start now, if you exercise now, you do it continually through your life. You have this very, um, functional eighties, nineties, you know, you, your percentages to be, uh, you know, out of a nursing home and self-sufficient and all these things are way, way higher. If you get to, you know, if you consistently do stay active through your whole life, not just start, stop, start, if you have to continually do it. Uh, and it was just, it's a, it's crazy. And there's a bunch of science within the book that kind of supports it and it makes, it makes total sense, but a lot of people know that, but it doesn't mean that they want to do it either. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's one thing to say, yeah, I want to, I would like to do that, but it's not easy. It's not always going to be easy, but yeah, you know, the, the other, like, like the other cliche, everyone says that the, the other hard is struggling through life, being obese, walking through upstairs when, you know, basic function stuff that you should, you're supposed to be do, you know, supposed to be able to do fairly easily, you know, and when that's hard, you know, you know, it, it's just, you have to pick your heart, <laughs> you know, yeah. do you want to be, do some hard workouts or do you want to have a hard life? You know, 
Hmm. Well, it can kind of spill over as a life lesson, I think, can't it? Like, do you want to do you want to watch TV now, or do you want to like put put some hard work into I don't know, writing a song or you know, sending off that CV or whatever? You know, um, it's yeah. such a difficult one. I'd never know. Um, I'd be interested to know where you, you know, if you were to look at say, so I'm yeah, I'm 25, right? So um, I oh, never man. know, huh? That's amazing. You enjoy it. It's amazing. I'm, 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 over, I'm twice your age and I'm telling you 25 is great. So like no, how, sorry, go ahead. Well, so, no, my question was, how would you, um, you know, wh- where do you think the balance is between hard work and like trying to achieve that, you know, your dreams and make things happen and enjoying, you know, the little things like going somewhere with friends or, you know, you know, name your thing that you enjoy doing, you know, um, how do you balance that? Like, for example, I have a really great group of friends here in, in Birmingham in the UK where I live. Um, and I have some great friends in London as well. And I love going to see them for the weekend and have a few drinks with them and sometimes a few too many drinks, but you know, um, but I kind of quite often I wake up the next morning and I was, yeah, I'm hungover, but I'm like, I had a really great time and it doesn't feel like a great time, like a sort of, um, you know, like when, you know, sometimes you, if you just, you go to, you go out till like four in the morning and you like, why did I do that? You know, it's not that it's like, okay, I've had a really great time with my friends and I don't know how to find that balance of enjoying that versus grinding and getting, putting the effort into my kind of musical stuff. I don't know how. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> I mean, there's definitely the balance game is, is tricky. Um, you know, I think a lot of people, some people, not a lot of people, actually a small amount of people actually find tremendous enjoyment obsessing about their craft, not isolating, but spending more the lion's share of their life doing like in, they enjoy their process. They enjoy their work. Uh, but that's why I mean by a small amount of people, there's only a few people that actually find something that they, that is a way that they sustain their life. And there's, you know, the way they make their, their livelihood and they actually enjoy and love doing it. You know, music is obviously one of those, you know, for you and I, it's it, music is complete joy and it is all that, but I know it's so, it's very important to be, to have those escape, you know, again, escape, but it's more of, so this one, so my, so my work life can thrive. I need to go and have these releases. I need to see these people. I need to have relationships. I need to, nurture my relationships and um you know i have the kids and it's very difficult for me to go on tours now because i'm missing so many moments of their life so it's a it's a hard balance act for me but i have learned and it's taken a long time where what's the, the balance is everything i have to make time for these other things um you going out and having a couple of drinks with your friends and having that kind of release. I think that's crucial, man. I think that's part of what makes a human life experience worth living. You have to have those laughs and the, the connection. And I've had some of the best times in my life in my mid twenties, drinking with my buddies and just, you know, and talking about life bonding, deep bonding, you know, like look in each other's eyes, man, I, you know, I love, you know, <laughs> you know, and let's, you know, screaming at at the the moon and, you know, all those things that that's those valuable, that's the life experience. And then you take all that and you move it to music, you know, and then you, you know, people go back to their jobs after they've had some, some of that. And then they're more like, you know, okay, I can, I got it's time to work. (laughs) I've, I've been howling at the moon for two days. I need to get back to work, you know, but I don't know, man. I when you figure that out, please tell me because it is balance is, is it's a hard thing because on the other side, you to get to another a high level, you have to sacrifice the uh, some of the fun. You have to give up some of that if you want because there's a lot of other people that are not doing anything but just creating and they're obsessed and they don't give a shit about anything you know, besides that, mm. and that's what you're competing against. So it, it, it's you know, it's a tough thing, man. If in sports and music and business, you know, there are, I think there, there are years of your life you do need to sacrifice and you need to give everything to it. And then later on, maybe you get a little more fun. Yeah. I think the, the thing that's particularly scary nowadays with particularly as musicians and particularly when you're writing music that, um, like, you know, the, the metal world, there are some 
bands that have managed to cross over into you know bands like Metallica where they've just like they're not pop music but they've crossed into like popular culture you know um but there aren't many metal bands you know um that kind of cross into that world and um the i think the the difficulty now is you're competing with you're not you know in terms of the way things like these instagram reels work on like youtube and stuff you're not just competing with other musicians you're competing with like i don't know youtubers and 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 uh I don't know anyone who wants to put content out because it's not just like you know it, content is all kind of in the same place now you know you, ha- yeah. you used to have like your CD player and then you'd have the TV and you'd have the computer and all of these different avenues were not in the same place so like the CD player you know you, you that would be where the music is and you're competing with everyone that's trying to be on the CD player whereas now it's all on the laptop or phone or whatever so yeah. I feel that's like it's a very interesting point. You know, so like I'm I'm also competing with the most interesting thing in the news, which feels so difficult to like. I, so I put out little clips from this podcast, right? And I put up little guitar lessons on my Instagram, and it's like there is no way my guitar lesson, even to me, is more interesting than like some guy doing a triple backflip off of a helicopter yeah. into a I don't know volcano or something. Like you know, it's just it, it's so difficult to try and compete with that. I think. Um, a bit there was a, um, there there was this interview that I just listened to with Rick Rubin and Trent Reznor. It was a fantastic, and his take on that was interesting too. It's kind of the same thing. He was like, he said, "I missed the attention that music used to get mm. in terms of there was no other distraction. It was like you would buy a record, you'd have one or two. Now you can scan. There's so many bands you can just you. On one hand, it's amazing because you have access to so much." If you think of a band or think of an old a song you love, you can access it immediately. That, and that's fantastic. But like you say, everything is kind of bottlenecked into this one lens and you're feeding it. And I, dude, I get caught in these reels and I'm just watching it and it's all geared toward my interest at, at this point. So I'm just like, oh, that's interesting. That's funny. Oh, this guy's an amazing guitar player. And I watched your like 20 clips of yours the other day and I got all into it and I thought there was like, there's a beautiful sincerity to all of these clips that you do. And, um, you know, but I was caught into it, you know, Mm -hmm. and it it was just, you know, it's very difficult. And I think it's a huge point that you made and it kind of makes me understand. Um, I have more gratitude for the era that I grew up because I do think, because I'm in this weird age where I, I can relate to what's happening now, but I was a part of this old model before in terms of our consumption of music. So I kind of understand both sides. I'm like caught in between, <laughs> but I am glad that I came up in the air where, where people would put music on and they would just watch, you know, listen to it and stare out their window. And I think that's a fascinating time, but you know, it's if you would have given me this phone back in 1989 and I would have had access to all that stuff, I would have been like, this is amazing. You know, mm. so, yeah, it's it's wild. Yeah, it's the idea. I think the other thing that, you know, you never just do one thing anymore either. Like you're always like watching TV and on your phone or like eating dinner yes. and watching TV or listening to music <laughs> and I don't know driving whatever you know what i mean like there's always something going stimulate me yeah and it's just like (laughs) the amount of times i'll be watching like i don't know i might put something on netflix or something i don't tend to watch that so much anymore i'm more into like podcasts now actually but then then my phone will flicker and i'll kind of flick through that for a bit i'm like why is that not enough like why you know um it's unbelievable you could have something intriguing and just i mean so in depth the documentary i'm completely in and i'll have the phone in hand and I'm just like, you know, text messaging people, you know, just or like scanning through, hmm. Googling what I'm watching on TV. You know, that, that, what, are, what is that? <laughs> oh man. I, uh, I was in, I was at the, uh, at the movies, uh, well, it was pro- probably a couple of years ago now. And there were these two guys on their phones, like the whole time, like having phone calls and everything. Um, and then it got to the end of the, mo- like last 20 minutes and one guy turned to the other guy and went, what's happening? I was like, what? <laughs> Why yeah. did you just watch the movie? Like, yes. um, it was so, it was so, I really wanted, I, I was, I wanted to just shout at him, but I was like, this is not going to, there's a big group of them. I was like, this isn't going to go well. Yeah. Um, 
<laughs> like if they're the kind of guys that are willing to just chat through like the whole film, there's no way they're going to respond well to me politely asking them to be quiet. I don't think I would. I wouldn't have been able to stay quiet. That drives me crazy at a movie theater. But yeah, that they're just yeah. Um, yeah, you mentioned um, you mentioned like sobriety and kind of going towards that. Is that was there like I mean you can go sort of get as personal not as you like, but was is there something that or, or like a something that flicked in your head like a sort of a, a light bulb moment where you're like okay this is something i want to go towards or was it like a gradual thing um i get that can be quite personal so obviously you don't have to go no um, no I, I, i've spoken on it many times um yeah. it, it was a lot of light bulbs flickering on and then getting smashed with a hammer with my alcoholism you know i i um i had to hit a series of bottoms like you've probably seen in many reels and inspirational quotes that are pushed through social media every day. But the, a lot of those things are true. Like I had to go and hit a, a series of bottoms. I had to lose a lot of options and friends and work. And, you know, I was playing with touring with corn at the time. And when I hit my last bottom and just, I had to lose a lot. I had, I had to have a, what I call the gift of desperation. Um, and that, that was necessary for me to get it. I don't think it's mandatory, but for me, um, that's just what pushed me into, I, I absolutely wanted to quit drinking, knew I had a problem, knew it was wrecking my life, knew my life was unmanageable, but I needed the ass whipping consistently, you know, to, to submit, you know, to just completely put up the white flag. And then I started figuring out that drinking was only the, like part of it, it was, I was doing that because of this, of a whole, you know, entire batch of problems, mentally old childhood traumas, old, a lot of things I had to deal with that were the drinking was the symptom of my, my issue. I had to deal with things. So I quit drinking long enough to understand that I need to work on myself to where I wouldn't put myself in a position to, to drink, to cope with everything, you know, we're drinking, I would put a drink in me. It quieted down all the voices. It quieted down all the trauma. All I felt whole, you know, when I drank and it's because I had a hole inside of my, my soul, my whole, you know, so me, uh, quitting drinking was just part of it. And then I've actually did some work on myself and, um, you know, and stayed, Sober a day at a time still. What, uh, what kind of like, are there any particular tools that you found, not necessarily tools, but like um, things that you found particularly helped that process, like certain activities or just certain like mindset sort of things that you could do to kind of, because I mean, I, I like to think anything that would work for sobriety would probably work for a lot of different, you know, issues that people are trying to work through. Are there things that kind of helped you, you can point to? Yeah. I mean, the, you know, without naming particular organ organization, um, what I went through and the steps that I took and the things that I did, I, I would recommend to anybody with, whether you have a drinking or drug issue or not, it's just about cleaning up your life, making amends to people, trying not to be selfish, trying to go through life, um, knowing that you're not the center of the universe, controlling your uh, ego, controlling your fear, um, just basic principle stuff that us as human beings could probably uh, benefit doing and, you know, not causing those, that wreckage. I mean, it's, it's to the point where I don't, if a piece of trash falls out of my pocket <clears throat> on the ground and I'm walking away, like my mind is like, you have to go pick that up. You can't leave that. And it sounds like a small man, like, oh, it's just a rapper. It is that I have, it's those tiny little seeds of deception or inconsideration. If I do that, it will, I'll allow myself to do that. I'll allow myself to start lying to my wife. I'll allow myself to start, uh, you know, stealing this, you know, just all these little things. That's just how my mind works. So I have to do all those little things so it doesn't grow into the, the, the old behaviors that, that my alcoholic self, uh, went through. And so, um, and for a lot of people, it may not be that deep, but it's just, you know, I just want to be a better person. So yeah, the program that I went through and the things that I did were, um, you know, 
there's like a series of steps and things you have to do. And, and then there's uh, accountability. There's people that I, I talk to on a daily basis that I, sometimes I don't want to talk to anybody, but I do it because I don't, it's not about me. It's about what I need to do and what these other people did to help me get sober and, you know, help and service work is a huge thing for me. I love to help people when, um, cause when I do that, it ultimately helps me. It makes me feel better. I get out of myself. If I'm, if you call me and you have a problem, I'm not thinking about me. I'm thinking about you and what you're going through. And if I'm truly listening to you, um, it feels good. I put my head down on the pillow knowing I listen to other people today, you know, and I'm, maybe I, maybe I said one nice thing that made people someone's day better. And it, it's corny to some of that stuff is, but it's, it's, I like to follow that, that, uh, that moral code, you know, tolerance and love for everyone. It's yeah. hard. <laughs> it's yeah, it's tricky. I think there's such a, um, the thing I've really been trying to the sort of, what do they say? The circle I've been trying to square or the square I've been trying to circle one way around. Can't remember. It's the, um, what do you, would you rather, I suppose you're meant to square a circle, aren't you? Square something. Yeah. I don't know. Um, either way, the thing I've been trying to figure out is in my head is like, um, how do you kind of, uh, there's been a few people in my life that I can point to, um, just out them on the podcast. Why not? No, I won't. Um, but where I feel like they've wronged me or, or their behavior has led to a, my life going in a way that I that wouldn't have chosen if that, you know, if that makes sense. And, and you kind of have to like ask yourself, how do you balance it? Cause I know, in their shoe, if I were in their shoes, maybe I would have acted the same way, you know. Um, and it's it's really difficult to try and have that humility, which I don't, I definitely haven't got. Like I'm trying and get in there, maybe um, that sort of acceptance of like, well, you know, if I were in their shoes, I probably would have done the same thing, or I would have been acted the same way. Um, but I feel like it's so difficult to, because as far as we're all aware, we're the only you know, we've only ever experienced our own consciousness, haven't we? So as far as we're aware, like, you know, yeah. we are the only person in the universe, you know, I don't know. Yeah. How yeah. Of... I mean, that's, that, those are the kind of rabbit holes that I, I'll go into at like midnight. I'll start thinking about, well, you know, I'm not the center of the universe, but in my conscious mind, <laughs> this is my universe. This is, I, I don't, the only view that I have is my view and the limitations of where my eyes stop you know and and where my mind stops you know and i do that all the time i don't know how healthy that is but I, you know i'm like um then i just try to remember like you only have a few years left on this one <laughs> try to enjoy it as much as you can you know mm -hmm. try to be a good person while, while you can yeah well i mean so um as, as something as, as sort of on a on a sort of positive note the um it I, I it's sort of, to sort of finish up and then I can get your sort of question into the, for the next guest. Um, yeah. I sort of got the impression from your sort of socials that you're quite a, like sort of family oriented, um, which, uh, it, and I think obviously as a young, again, me as a younger person, um, you know, I obviously have my values placed somewhere. There are things I'm trying to achieve. I'd like to have a family at some point, but, um, you know, how do you look at maybe your values as a younger person versus what your kind of values are now? Are there things you think you maybe places where you sort of misplaced value as a young person that you maybe recognize now wasn't valuable? If that oh, makes sense. Man. Absolutely. Um, I, I think that put a tremendous value on what people thought of about me or um, <clears throat> my worth was, I put a lot of um, value in, in what, you know, the group of people that I was playing with or anyone that I would meet, I really wanted people to like me. I was very much a people pleaser and did that for many years in my youth. And, um, whereas now, and that there was a lot of, there was a lot of anxiety that came with that. There was a lot of pressure. There was a lot of unhappiness. I don't want to say depression, but I really wanted to be liked. Um, I really wanted to be loved and I, that, that, is centered around abandonment issues, you know, and, and different things like that. But when I was young that I cared when I'm in my, I'm comfortable in my own skin. So a lot of times in, my, in the past, I was, I was someone else. I was, I would adapt to what your personality was because I want, 
you to like me. So I will, I would just go along with a lot of things that I just really, I don't, I really don't agree with that, but I like this person. I want them to like me. So I'm going to adjust my personality scope. And, um, now I don't do that. I, I just, I, I don't, I don't try to do like, you know, if there, if there's an awkward, if there's a silence between me and a person and we're just not gelling in a conversation or energy, or we're just not feeling it. I don't try to force it. I just I sit in the silence. And if someone says something I don't agree with, I don't nod and say, yeah, yeah, I understand. I'm me too. I don't, I don't do those things anymore. And, and I don't go do things with people that I don't want to do. Um, because you know, I did that a lot and I was kind of miserable. So I guess the short answer is I just don't people please the way I did. I, I'm more comfortable with who I am. And I know that quality friendships are better than quant the quantity of, of people that I have in my life. I have a smaller group of people that I'm comfortable and truly myself around. And that's what I gravitate toward. I used to try to, you know, thank God social media wasn't as big as it was when I was 25 because I would have been all over that love me, try to find as many people to validate my insecurities as possible, you know? Um, but you know, and that's why I, I, I worry about my kids, you know, <clears throat> because they have some of those traits and things like that. And I just want, I don't want them. I can already see them very, very much worried about what the other people think and what the kids think. And, you know, but that's, that's teenage life. That's just what it is. I don't think there's any way around, around it, you know? Yeah. I was thinking about, it's like you talk, you know, you're talking about kind of growing out of stuff. And I, I do wonder if, you know, I'm, I, I kind of, I've chatted to quite a few people who've, you know, sort of had similar experiences and it's like, I don't know if you can bypass it. Cause I, I still have, definitely have a lot of these things and I, I don't know if maybe it is just something you have to sort of live through and accept. I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know if there's just some like Zen twenty five year old out there that's just got all this down. I don't know if that. I don't know if that guy exists. Like, um, I, I think you're absolutely right. I don't think there was any way around it. I think that's just the nature of how we are, and 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 on a, and a on a like a cellular level, like a DNA. I think we just want to be in a village, and we want to know the villagers, and we want. It's like to to survive. I think you have to find your your people. And you're kind of, I was desperate to do that. So I just, anyone, yeah. you know, I wanted to be friends with everybody. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's wicked, man. Yeah. Well, no, I, I, I it's interesting to hear how you've kind of, again, I think maybe I'll figure it out. <laughs> I'll figure it out one day. That's my plan. Just enjoy. And I not, yeah. not to mean this from a condescending, right. like just enjoy the youth. And, um, you, you seem like you have your head on a way, way straighter than I did. So. Um, yeah, man, you're going to be just fine. And man, I th enjoy it. You know, yeah. make the mistakes. That's, that's the beauty. <laughs> you know, you, you can make mistakes. If I'm doing knucklehead stuff at 20, you know, at 51, it's just not as charming. <laughs> yeah. 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 But you're an intelligent man. You're going to do great, man. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah. Well, when I'm out at four in the morning, I'll be like, "Well, I've got permission." <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, don't, don't, don't go do any. <laughs> this is the crazy. I need like, you just to the sign. The last thing you said on the <laughs> podcast was, "Yeah, go be crazy." Yeah, yeah. that's wicked, man. But I've, I've really enjoyed chatting, man. So, um, if we could get, so I need a question to open the next conversation, which I will be having actually in about uh, about twelve hours time. Um, okay. So, uh. That'd be cool if we can get some sort of question to start the conversation. And then an artist you think deserves some love as well. Um, there is a kid that is a guitar player and I want to get his name, his last name, right. But yeah, he yeah. is an amazing, amazing guitar player. He's very young. He's 17. Um, but he's just thriving. And his name is Landon S uh, Sabians. Hold on. Sorry. So good. <laughs> I had it pulled up. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh Landon. Uh, so you, it's spelled S I E B E N S music. Landon Sabian. Is that how, how, how would you say Sibin? that? Sibin? Yeah. There it is. Okay, cool. This He's an amazing guitar player and yeah. he's an up and comer and I'm just really proud of him. And mm. he, he puts a bunch of videos up. He's a really great guitar player. Yeah. Um, but yeah. 
I would usually would say an artist that's signed and doing well, but I like to give a shout out to the, to, to the, Oh youngsters. yeah. Yeah. It's good to, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it has more effect that way, doesn't it really? Um, so yeah, yeah. I was talking, yeah, I was talking to him yesterday and, uh, we were just, we talking about music and life and I just thought I'd give him a shout out. So the question is that for, um, is it for a musician, obviously? So yeah, it's, uh, I, I won't tell you who it is because I think it's more interesting if it, if you don't know who it's for. Okay. Um, it's going to be someone in a musical world. Okay. Um, so broad enough, oh, I guess. Oh, but... man. That Dream Theater question was so good. That was of a good question. It's going to come yeah. from someone yeah. from Dream Theater. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I the question wanna... kind of matched the like the band energy, I feel, in terms of the... Uh, the yeah. Yeah. Um, let me see. What... What is one of your biggest regrets in your musical career that you, let me, how how do I phrase this? What is one of your biggest regrets in your musical career? Uh, That's so negative. Hold on. There was a way I wanted to spin it. You could spin that positively. Yeah. So, um, well, like, how did you sort of resolve it, or like, if there was one thing you could change in the first five years of your playing, what would it be? Nice. Okay. Yeah. 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 That's an interesting one. Yeah. Makes you think about like what direction you kind of took with it. I um, I yeah. I never. I don't know what mine would have. Mine would have been not not quit when I was thirteen. Probably have been <laughs> my. Uh, oh, yeah. I picked it back up when Wait, I was like. Yeah. I picked it up when I was like eighteen. I was like, oh shit, I've got some catching up to do. <laughs> yeah. um, so, uh, but it's kind of a good thing because then it made me, you know, um, get my shit together pretty quickly. Um, so, yeah. so yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, cool. Is there anything you want to plug to sort of finish up? No, I'm. A, well, you have a new Seven Dust record coming out, Truth Killer, in July, a couple of weeks from now. So Sweet. please check it out. Go to sevendust.com and Instagram and all the all the social media. And we're we're, st- right, so. we're still out there. <laughs> Wicked. Well, thank you very much, man. Yeah, thank you very much.